Good morning, Alan, and good afternoon to all of uh, all the participants. It's a great honor for all of us to have Alan among us and to that to hear his talk on the Lamese. And also since BSI and uh, Q has a lot of good relation earlier, and today also still we have, because we used to have our liaison officer in uh, Q Garden, but unfortunately, these days we are not having, but we hope to resume soon if possible. But uh, today's talk is going to be very uh, important. And then I think I, uh, I need not explain what uh, Alan is going to say or about his expertise. You must have seen his biography already about his biodata, which you have already circulated. Lamese is a very difficult uh, family and also very difficult group of uh, plants uh, taxonomically for identification are quite tough. That's what they used to say. So I'm sure by today's talk, what Alan is going to give us, it is going to enlighten us and it will throw the train what is going on today on te uh, uh, this uh, Lamese taxonomy. And I'm sure we are going to, all of us are going to learn a lot. And I thank you so much, Alan, for uh, accepting our people request to be the speaker for today. And the topic or the, uh, the title you have chosen is very much relevant to Botanical Survey of India, uh, as we are from the taxonomy field. So thank you once again. And then, I think, uh, and then you can tell, uh, Alain, to start, maybe. Thank you, Professor Mao. I'd just like to begin by thanking all uh, the Botanical Survey of India um, for inviting me to give this talk. I'd also like to thank them for inviting me to Calcutta in, in, in the times that we have all forgotten before COVID. Um, I was there about a year ago, uh, and I very much enjoyed my time. So thank you. Okay, uh, today we're going to be talking about Coelus and Plectranthus. And I'll begin with an introduction. I'll, I'll say a little bit about the tribe in which Coelus and Plectranthus uh, belong to before I begin with talking about the Plectranthidae in detail. I'll say a little bit about the phylogeny and the classification. And then uh, because it's a Friday afternoon and nobody should listen to a talk on only one group of plants for, for an hour and, and, and Friday afternoon, I'm going to say a little bit about lumping and splitting and uh, I'll say a little bit about salvia, which is, which is a similar situation but also different in some ways. And, and really just to think about how we recognise genera um, or what, what groups we choose to recognise as genera. Perhaps is a better way of putting it. And then I'll finally finish with a little bit about how we use it, the phylogeny um, to look at patterns, whether it's habitat distribution or medicinal use. Okay, um, so tribotomy, pantropical uh, and subtropical, largely old world. Uh, there was one group which is predominantly new world, which I'll mention in a wee while. We have about just over a thousand species and the diagnostic feature is declinate stamens. So I'll just explain that. Um, uh, there we go. I hope for you can see my laser pointer. In the osame, the stamens come down over the lower lip of the corolla. Uh, there are a few exceptions to that, but basically most of the genera have this character. In other groups of the uh, Lamiaceae, particularly the Nepetoidae, the subfamily which also begins, the stamens usually come up this way under the upper lip. But here the, the stamens are down below, so it's depositing pollen in the underside of a visiting insect rather than the back of the visiting insect. So the tribe, the Osame, was initially recognised as a subfamily by Bentham in 1829. Um, at that stage, uh, there was no overview of, of Lamiaceae, and 
Lindley, who asked Bentham, Lindley was at that time president of the Royal Horticultural Society in London, um, actually asked Bentham to look into the labiate and sort it. And as he described it, rescuing them from a state of confusion. And uh, I'm not sure, although Bentham did a fantastic job of, of giving us a family outline, which still by and large um, uh, works today for the bits he covered. The family has got bigger because of the addition of things in Verbenese. But Bentham's work still serves as a basis for understanding the family. However, we haven't quite rescued them from a state of confusion because there are bits of the family which are still quite confused. And uh, Coleus and Pythanthus is one of those. So this is a bit of work in progress, really. Um, this is a, a, a phylogenetic hypothesis of, of the tribe, Osimi, uh, based on Yaping Cheng's work, who um, was looking at Cypho-Karenian and Hansi Ho, and she still is. And we can see here, I don't know, my little pointer still working, but Tranfini and Osimi are sister groups. Osimini uh, contains Osim and Platystoma. Macrocephalus, which is an Indian group, um, and Pectranthus contains Coleus and Pectranthus and Ionizochylus, which I'll talk a bit about later. Um, on the plastid group DNA, that is, they come out sister. Um, and that's true for most of the phylogenies published since 2004. Pectranthini and Osamini on plastid data are sisters. Yaping yeah, also looked at the nuclear DNA, and here the pattern is a little bit different in that they do appear to be separate. However, note the lack of resolution in this backbone. Um, the other thing about that sample is it's very Asian based, uh, and Yaping yeah, and Chun Li Zhang um, are, are looking now at some of the African members of this group. And I think that might make a difference to the, to the relationships. And, and we'll have to see whether we're still in compatibility between the past and, uh, and nuclear DNA. Um, however, for most of this talk, I am going to assume that this one, is, this relationship is, is, um, is correct. Um, but just bear in the back of your mind, it's still a little bit work in progress, but um, I think um, this one is also morphologically supported, which I'll, I'll talk about later as well. Okay. So tribotomy, declinate stamens, uh, sister relationship of Osamine and Pactfanfine. Now, there are seven subtribes of Osamine. Some of them are quite small, Lavangine, Cyphocrine, only one genus. Um, Lavangine is quite small as well, one genus, but, but 36 species. So I'm about to give you a quick overview of those genera. And also Isodon, which is one genus, but much more um, species and actually quite important in India, uh, which I'll come back to as well. The Hyptodyne is New World. So although you do get species of Hyptus, it's recently been split up um, into things like Mesospherum, Hyptus suaviolens and Mesospherum suaviolens, for example. Very widespread pantropical weeds. Uh, so there are a few species which are Anthropical weeds, and there's also one probably which is native to West Africa. But essentially, this is a new world group, and I'm not really going to say very much about the Hyptodyne at all today. Okay, I groups some debate as to whether the Schultzi is sister to the Osamine, is the Osame. The balance of current opinion is that it is the sister, but there is also some some of the phylogenetic um, phylo, uh, hypotheses have a Schultz as sister to Menfie um, and then also my sister to that kind. So again, there's a little bit of uh, um, unknown. However, I think the important thing is here, tribosomy 
is monophyletic. Subtribe like Tranfine is, is monophyletic, and subtribe Osamine is, is monophyletic. The relationships are a little bit in flux. Okay, just uh, give you a quick look at what these things look like. This is Cyphocranian, three species. Um, Yapping Chen described this one recently, uh, with Julie and myself. Um, this is from the Chinese Vietnamese border. Cyphocranian is Chinese and, and Eastern Himalayan, three species, typically single flowered cymes. Lavangela really concentrated in the Mediterranean area with a kind of also a, a species variation in the Canary Isles, um, two subgenera, one of which is more or less restricted to the Canary Isles and Atlantic Islands. 36 species are not um, very heavily used medicinally in cosmetics uh, and in aromatic oil. Hansiola, um, again, Hansiolaini, uh, about nine species of that. One of them we just described this year. Uh, tends to have pedunculate cymes, this kind of open, like open corolla mouth. Um, which distinguishes it a bit from the Cyphocranian. The calyx is more like a pythanthus with a big upper lobe and four smaller lobes. And then Isodon. Um, now, Isodon, formerly um, back in Florida, British India's days, and but also which continued to, which, which was the, the commonly accepted belief that Isodon was part of Pipe Tranfus until about the 80s when Olaf Rudding, um, well, actually 90s, when Olaf Rudding in Copenhagen um, worked out that actually they were nothing to do with one another. Uh, the reason they were probably put is the Corolla, it, it, superficially, it's very similar. Um, Isodon tends to have three upper lips of the calyx uh, and two lower ones. Um, they tend to be equal in size, hence Iso the same dawn for teeth. And I'll say a little bit more about the differences between Isodon and Pactanthus in a moment. Okay, Hyptodyne, this is a new world group, um, over 250 species. The Hyptodyne, almost in all species have this, have a, a lower lip of the corolla, which is held under tension and uh, and thesis, it flips downwards. You can see here. Oh, I lost my control of my mouse here. Uh, flips downward and it releases the stamens explosively. Almost all Hyptodyne do that. There's a thickened hinge at the base of the lower lip of the calyx. Uh, Ray Harley and Florian Pastore have, uh, about 10 years ago now, reconfigured the genera of the Hyptodyne and recognized now about 12 general within it. Um, okay, well, that's all I'm going to say about these new worlds today. Now, an important morphological character in Osama is the presence of these bracteoles, little scales. This is a sign. The inflorescence, as in most labiates, is a first. You have an indeterminate axis here, and you have axillary signs. This is a kind of very open one. They can be quite condensed. But sometimes these cymes have little scales here, which are uh, leaf-like structures uh, at the joints of the, stime, of the cyme. And quite often, they are very useful to tell you which part of the osame you're in. So osamine and pyctranfine don't have bracteoles. Everything else does. You get the occasional species where it's lost, and there's even one species of white fanfish which seems to have reinvented them. But generally, you don't get fractals in the oscillate and pipe fan finding. These are by far the biggest groups, Hyptus, Ossolini, and pipe fan finding. Okay. So just looking at the morphology of it. 
The pike clan finae have the stamens all close together at the base of the lower corolla lip. Usually the, the upper lip of the calyx is bigger, but they can all be the same size as well. In Isodon, you have a separation of the stamens. This, the anterior stamens tend to, um, sorry, the posterior stamens tend to, to connect to the tube lower down than the anterior. And the same is true in Osamine. Usually when you have zygomorphy in an Isodon calyx, you have three lips over two rather than one over four, as you do in Quetlanthus. And also mine are rather like um, uh, the isodonine in, in stamen cap position of stamens. The stamens tend to be separate at the point of insertion, um, except in the osamine, you do not get bracteals, which you do get in isodonine. So where the apomorphy for the pike fine fine is the stamens attached and corolla float. Although there is one group which is off that character, which I will come back to later. So we're going to talk a little bit about the osamine and pike fan fine now. Now this is again is work in progress, really. This is an old slide. It's, this is the position as of 2004. Um, we've just, Alistair Colm and I at Reading have just had a PhD student, uh, Ashwak Altabafi, Al who's just been looking at this in more detail. The current published phylogeny suggests Osimum is paraphyletic. Um, with two groups. However, Recent work suggests it's not. They are actually monophyletic with uh, better data and more robust analysis. Uh, but just bear in mind that the generic groups within um, Osamine um, are actually quite robust generally. Uh, we're not, from uh, Ashwak's work, not going to suggest any major generic realignment at all. Um, there's one or two species which are in the wrong genus, but otherwise it, it kind of is congruent with this classification. It's just a bit more detailed and, and possible is monophyletic rather than paraphyletic. So this is, uh, this is awesome. Uh, quite difficult at species level, couple of complexes. This is what's colloquial known as Thai basil, at least in the UK. And this is likely to be a hybrid between Osimum africanum and uh, Osimum basilicum. You get all kinds of, uh, also this group Osimum basilicum is essentially a polyploid sequence. And you get, you get hybridization between different levels and uh, particularly between the hexaploid and the tetraploid. And that, that's been used in breeding to get different flavors of basil. Uh, Osimum is, and Orphosiphon uh, are the only other genera which have new world members. Uh, this is Osimum cellulae, Carnosum rather, um, which is native to Brazil and related in neighboring areas. This is for a genus which used to be called Visium, again, another very complex genus at species level. Um, about 50 species and uh, sorry the subgenus uh, this belongs in has got about 40 species and uh, their species are quite close morphologically. This is also known subgenus um, Nautochylus, more or less restricted to South Africa but there's one species which occurs all the way up to Ethiopia. There are tend to be beautiful plants um, and they are grown a lot in horticulture in southern Africa. They are not particularly hardy, um, but there is a lot of horticultural interest in this group. Okay, Platostoma um, used to consist of about eight genera until someone and I lumped them together. Uh, things like Mesona, Acrocephalus all went into Platostoma. Uh, it's got an interesting um, habitat preference, Platostoma, which I'm going to talk about at the very end. 
and orthosiphon. Uh, again, we claim if orthosiphon also has some segregates, which are basically uh, have two sterile stamens. Um, but they do seem to be uh, not merged fully within orthosiphon. So uh, they seem to be sister to the main clade of orthosiphon. This is also Maristatus, which is used medicinally in Asia for uh, uh, blood pressure disorders, amongst other things. And again, it's very often in Thailand, at least, you see this growing a lot around temples. It's quite a striking thing. Okay, just a reminder before we move on to the Pact Fanfine. So if stamens are attaching in the coral throat. Morphologically, in some ways, it's quite diverse in that you get big flowers, small flowers, a whole bunch of different calyx morphology. But the coral is remarkably um, conservative, uh, with the exception of one group, which we'll come on to. Um, Basically, it seems to be highly constrained. You've got a lower lip which holds the stamens. Sometimes the lower lip flexes, sometimes it doesn't. The calyx, on the other hand, can be very variable. Um, this is a Madagascan group, for example, which has very open um, calyx lobes. Okay. 455 species in the Ossamayne. Uh, I should probably just check, you can still hear me and I'm not talking to myself in the middle of London. <laughs> uh, okay. Anand, can you still hear? I've still got contacts, so I hope we're still sharing. Please hide. hide. Okay, I was just checking. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Okay, uh, so Coleus and Pectoranthus have been recognized since the beginning in of the taxonomic works of Osame. This is uh, Bentham's second major work of the, the Labiatarum. And and in the Plectranfini, you recognised five of the genera. The, and that kind of, although Coleus was suggested to be um, the same genus as Plectranfus back in 1810, until about the 60s, they were largely held to be separate genera. Um, John Morton, working in the flow of West Top of Africa, recognised 10 genera. But you merged Coleus into Pythanthus. Why did you do that? So this is the kind of type concepts of Coleus and Pythanthus. This is Coleus Egyptiacus. It's very closely related to the type of Coleus, which is Coleus amboinicus. They have stamens fused together in a tube. Well, not in a tube, in a flat plate, really. So those stamens which always joy, which always insert to the coral very close to one another, in the type of coleus are joined and fused together. The upper lip of the coral is very low. The calyx is very often slightly curved uh, and slightly asymmetric at the point of insertion. This is Plectranthus. Uh, type species, Pectranthus fruticosus. Pectranthus means spurred flower, so very often you have a gibbous or spurred base to the corolla. Corolla tends to be straight. Stamens are separate, still attaching in the same point. And the corolla, upper and lower corolla, so more or less equal in size. But the initial difference was only done on the basis of stamens. Were they fused? If so, it was a coleus. Are they separate? If so, it's a plectranthus. However, the problem with that is you get something like this, 
uh, and actually this is probably the common state in, in, in COIS. You have three stamens. The stamens are separate. Uh, the calyx otherwise looks very much like... Um, just apologise for the dog. This is one of the hazards of, of working from home with COVID. <laughs> I should have apologised in the first. You may hear more dogs barking as motorbikes go past. Um, so the stamens are separate. In this case, the curl, the calyx is still slightly asymmetric, slightly curved. In small flowers, the difference between curl and size is harder to see. And this is quite a small flower, so the lips look closer to being the same size when they do look to be separate sizes. So the traditional definitions were difficult to employ. This is calyx in West Africa, really. This is um, what Morton did basically was uh, look at the calyx and weight the calyx to recognize genera. So he recognized a whole bunch of things, um, but because it, he's, he thought the calyx was fundamentally the same as as a Pyctranthus calyx, he put coleus into Pyctranthus because he realized the character of fused stamens really doesn't work. It, it, very closely related species can have either fused species, uh, fused stamens or separate stamens. So it's a very homoplastic character and not a sound basis for the recognition of monophyletic groups. One of the issues with Morton's work was it was actually based on a very small sample of species. He was working on the flora of West Tropical Africa, and although he had he was aware of other African plants, he had travelled in Africa. His genetic concepts worked for flora of West Tropical Africa, but they didn't really work outside that. Um, nonetheless, his decision to join Coleus and Pythanthus together was more or less accepted, um, although different genera were not always accepted. So we did have a bit of an issue, and Martin was aware of that issue. Um, he lumped Coleus into Pectranthus, but realised that the, his generic classification didn't account for the full variation within Pectranthus. A few years later, Kramer, working in Sri Lankan flora, um, maintained coleus as a genus. And as we'll see later, that's highly, hardly surprising. If you look at Asian species are largely coleus. Um, they are rather similar. And quite a few of them have fused stamens. So as far as he was concerned, um, coleus still worked as a genus. But again, he realised that he was really having a problem. His, his generic delimitation really was, was a practical one, um, not conclusive and not authoritative, which I think was quite... Both him and Martin were, were very honest in realising that there were issues with, with what they were proposing. So when I was last in Calcutta last year, this plant was growing outside the National Herbarium. But because of the confusion of generic limits, it is called Coleus scutellarioides, Pectranthus scutellarioides, or Solenostemon scutellarioides. And you will see all three of these in the literature. Um, and this is just a kind of symptom of the, of the chaos of not having one classification which could be applied across all areas where ocular pyctranthus and coleus occur. The problem largely is the coleus and pyctranthus are most diverse in East Africa. Um, and it wasn't really until 2013 when we finished the floors of East Tropical Africa and Zambizaka, we had a good level of understanding of that diversity and, and began to uh, create hypotheses of what might be related to what. So we're moving now from a kind of um, 
um, very narrow regionally based to a more to a, to a review which looks more broadly across a range of those species. In 2004, that's before the African faunas were finished, um, this is generally, Kibitsky's account is generally, until very recently, used as, as a framework. And it's still for generic descriptions, the best place to go to for generic descriptions. Uh, Lee Bo, Olmsted, and Chung Li Zhang and others um, have done a plastome uh, assessment of subfamilies and tribes and that gives a far more updated view of what genera exist and, and how they are related but this is still very much kind of standard treatment at species level and at genus level. The view we took in this account was to be a bit conservative. Um, we knew we hadn't finished the analysis of the Asian species, um, although that was Thai species had just been done. So we, we deliberately were a little bit conservative as to what we decided to recognize. So we, we, so we went for really the status quo at the time, which was to recognize a large Ectranthus. But we knew that, like Morton and like Kramer, knew there was a bit of an issue with it. So using Kibitsky, Harley's et al, um, description of a white tranfiny in Kibitsky's work, we set out to sample across that group. And we ended up with a sample of about 20% 20, 20 of the species to sequence um, using um, RPS 16 Turner, I have Turner SG. We did do a very brief survey on ITS, which more or less um, gave similar results, but um, we did have issues with ITS. And there was a group in South Africa who are working on that now. So we should get the nuclear markers published quite soon. Um, and in terms of the monophyletic groups I'm going to be discussing, it's basically congruent. Um, there may be some differences in how those monophyletic groups relate to one another. The thing I want you to realize in this slide is that the broad concept of Pectranophis is highly paraphyletic. An isochylus, which is Indian and Southeast Asian, and Pycnostachus, which is African and bred completely within one clade of Pectranophis. Pectranophis forms separate clades. But also there's a bunch of other genera which need to be considered when we view what we mean by Pletranthus and Coleus, which to this point really hadn't been done. It was always taken as just as a as two genera, Pletranthus and Coleus. They must be they must be sister groups. However, that's not the case. Um, the thing to point here is that the clade containing the type of Coleus, this one is actually sister to a group which contains all the other Pytranophyne genera and two separate clades of Pytranophyne. These clades are monoph monophyletic. There is here and here lower resolution. So the relationships of those five clades is not completely robust. But each genus recognized here is strongly supported as a monophyletic group. So we go nip through these clades. So this is Coleus and if you map the characters onto the clade, most of the species have a very short upper lip, bigger lower lip. The calyx tends to be um, of the pedicel attaching to the opposite upper lip. Basically there's there's growth of the lower part of the calyx here that becomes gibbous at the base of the calyx. Quite often it's curved. You get various changes in the lobes which Morton used, but actually those are quite fluid. Um, you do get different groups which have similar looking calyces, so it's not strong, but, but this character does seem to work quite well in the phylogeny. Usually the corolla tube is sigmoid. Uh, if you see it, you'll see it more clearly in some other photos. Um, the bracts, i.e. the leaf-like things here, there's one just to the left here, tend to fall off. 
And the stamens can be fused or completely separate, um, but they always all attach at the base of the corolla. This, in this case, this is Prochlonophus, uh, sorry, Colis barbatus, they are fused. This clade contains an Isochylus and Pycnostachus. It's Pycnostachus here, African group, um, sigmoid corolla, upper lip tends to be shorter than the lower lip, highly sigmoid corolla. And again, this is uh, an Isochylus, same sort of thing. Um, At the base of the sister colis, we've got two genera, which are both African and Isochylus and Alvesia, and both of these have very unusual calices. In Aeolanthus, um, you get a circumcessible calyx. Top half falls off and releases the um, nutlets, a little bit, a bit like what happens in Plantago. Some species of this also have an explosive pollination mechanism. Uh, about 30 odd species, 40 odd species of, of Aeolanthus. Alvesia, three species of it, and this is characterized by having these big bladder like calices, um, which are actually only three lobed rather than five lobed. Uh, this is found in the drylands of southern tropical Africa. Now, the Madagascan group is interesting. Before this work, there were four genera recognized, um, but they're all in the same clade, so six species, and these six species have been divided into four different genera. So one thing we did was we joined, we've put those together as one genus, Capitanopsis. The calyx is very variable in this group, and that's why it had been recognized as four separate groups. Um, but actually, they have got far more to do with one another than they do with um, anything else and uh, I think there are three monotypic genera and one genus with three species so uh, putting them together seems to make sense. Uh, you do get, as in Madagascar very often, very strange thing happens. So this is a, a pinatifid lead leaf in, um, in Madagascan Lemiesi. And normal family descriptions, uh, apart with the exception, it does actually happen more more often. There's one species of Wetranthus which also does this, uh, but generally it's not a character you see in family descriptions. That the leaves can be pinnatifid. So six species, one genus endemic to Madagascar. Now this is where the issues begin to happen with what I said earlier about the all corolla shapes in, in Pyctranthus and the Pyctranthus being similar. This is Tetradenia, a group of about 30 odd species, and the flowers come close to being actinomorphic, certainly in the corolla, um, and also they tend to be dioecious. The big thing though is the stamens are fully spreading. They're not connected together at the bottom of the lower lip. They connect from the back in the tube. The flowers are much reduced. It's almost as if the bud is becoming adult, like in the autumn year, um, the flower bud begins to mature before developing that strong relationship between the stamens and the, the lower lip of the corolla. Um, so it looks very odd, and as a result, no one uh, was quite sure where it belonged. If you look at the plants, it grows in very similar habitats in dry Africa to some species of, of coleus. And the calyx is very coleus like. Uh, but there's other fact characters which look a bit like Tranthus, true Pythanthus like, particularly the calyx. Um, this is Foreign Croftia, it's a group of only four species restricted to South Africa. But again, you get this tend to, to more radial symmetry in that the lateral lobes of the corolla drop down near the lower lip. In the same way it happens here uh, in this group. So those two are sister groups, um, but, but look very different. Foreign Croftia is never dioecious, it's always monoecious. Uh, sorry, always, always hermaphrodite.
Okay, so this is a type clade, the, the clade that belongs to type, holds a type of Brechtronophus. Usually we have a, have something swollen at the base of the corolla, lip sequel, in length or the upper one indeed, can not and unfrequently is longer. Stamens are not fused together. Uh, um, the calyx lobes, the last lobes, are usually much closer to the lower lips than they are to the midway point. In coelus, they tend to be in the midway point, but in this clade, they tend to drop down. Yeah. And then there's this group, which really doesn't have a name as such yet. Um, uh, is a group of almost all tropical African species, uh, about 40 species, but there are two species in India. Um, what was Pectronophus mollus falls into this group. Um, and you, again, you've got equal corolls, but you've got this sigmoid tube like coleus. The calyx is more like coleus than it is like Pectronophus. Um, you have equal lobes, and you, the bracts are usually persistent. So, when we look at it, that's more or less what we're looking at. We have a coleus group, we've got a Pectronophus group, we've got something which I've not given a name to yet, and you've got those other genera. Important point is that coleus is sister to the other genera within the Pectronophus. So it's not simply a conversation of whether it's coleus or Pectronophus. We have to consider those things as well. Okay, so, oh, my one, back, up. Um, so how do you recognize genera here? There's basically two choices. One is the whole thing is one genus, perfectly monophyletic. Um, we, could view, we could do that. Or we could recognize each of these monophyletic genera uh, and groups as genera. Or we could recognize them as subgenera. So the question is, do we recognize the whole lot as one genus? Or, which isn't far from uh, uh, what Linnaeus did actually, uh, or do we recognize those groups as independent genera? So if you lump them, there's a fair number, number of change. You change 10, ten current genera based on the Harley baseline, Kibitsky baseline, and 138 name species which change have to be changed, or you can split them. You get eight generic letters, so you get fewer generic changes, but you get more species uh, changes. However, you, we should note that a lot of what was recognized in has already had names in colonies. A lot of these things were originally described as colonies as well than Pectronophus. Now, what's interesting is if you look at how Coleus and Pectronophus have been used. So, if you do look, go into Google search, I picked 2004 as when the latest baseline was published. It's about 30 years after, or 25 years after um, most taxonomic works adopting the broad Pectronophus concept rather than recognizing Coleus. But when you search Google over this period, Whereas most taxonomists agreed we should just merge them, the rest of humanity carried on regardless, more or less. Over twice as many papers still used the name Coleus and didn't mention Pectronophus. And there were half as many used Pectronophus and didn't mention Coleus. What was interesting is very few papers, about a thousand papers, gave the synonyms and said coleus and Pectronophus. Um, so, which is a solitary lesson to taxonomists, that um, although we can get passionately involved with this, the rest of the scientific community and the rest of mankind um, 
doesn't always care and and there are significant bar barriers to name changes are being being accepted in the world one of the reasons i decided to split and recognize Corius as a genus was because of tetradenia if we recognize the whole of Plectophanthony is one genus. Morphologically, it would be very difficult to describe because of Tectodia and Foglofty to some extent, where you don't have a character which diagnoses the whole clade. It works at subtribal level as a kind of spot character, but any group of a thousand species kind of is going to have some exceptions. Um, but you do probably, we probably do want a genera to be. Um, um, communicable. So my decision was to recognize Coleus as a genus, 294 species. This new one, clade two we're discuss discussing, as Equilabium, 42 species, and Pytranthus is type, containing a type with 72 species. So that is the generic treatment that we published. And that means that this is the correct name for this plant. Should, accepted name should be Coleus scutellarioides. Now, of course, one of the things you have to do once you've decided how best to treat the phylogeny in generic delimitation is you need to make sure the names under these genera exist. Um, nobody's ever going to follow classification. Indeed, one of the problems of genetic limitation is when you have a robust phylogenetic hypothesis, but the names to employ that, that suggested limitation don't actually exist. So in many ways, this is probably the most boring paper I've ever written, 150 pages of nomenclature. Um, but it's important because if the names don't exist, um, we're not really doing a prime function of taxonomists to recognize taxa and give them identifiers, which can be used uh, to manage the information we hold about those taxa. So it's, uh, it's an important bit of work. Oops, I went the wrong way. I also think that a group like this has a lot of people working on it around the world. So it's important to get the people who are actively publishing to come to some kind of agreement. So we had Montfort, who sadly has now died, from Malawi, Michael Andrew Smith from Calicut University, Trevor and Paul Forster from Australia, someone uh, working in India, uh, working on the uh, Indo Chinese species. Pete, Philipson, who works a lot on the Madagascan species. So we kind of didn't just kind of, there's nothing more infuriating for a botanist who's been working in a group regionally to find that somebody has changed all these names and he's no longer working or she's no longer working in the group. Uh, the, name, the name of the group she's working on has been changed without any consultation. So I think this is quite important that you try and engage with the people who are publishing. A slight break from Plectranfus per se, I'm doing for time. Um, and think about um, this business about do you, where in the phylogeny do you draw the line? Um, where in the phylogeny hypothesis, I should say, do you draw the line? What, do you, what sort of criteria do you use to recognize genera? what are the issues? So the first one is phylogeny. Now, we have to bear in mind that nomenclature was developed, when well, nomenclature was developed 105 years before the origin of species was published. So I think most people would agree that we do want monophyletic groups. You, we want to recognize taxa, which are the known endpoints of the current state of evolution. It's not always possible, but that should be our ambition. 
So it is important that the taxa we recognise have some evolutionary reality. However, that said, I don't think we can ask the, the rather crude device of nomenclature of Linnaean ranks to utterly reflect all the taxonomic nuances of a phylogeny. If you're principally interested in the phylogeny, look at the phylogeny. Don't rely entirely on nomenclature. The nomenclature should guide it, it should be consistent with it, but it's really not designed to give the detail of evolutionary relationships. Nomenclature stability is clearly important in that we don't want change, names changing without any reason. One of the principal, one of the main principles behind the International Code of Nomenclature for uh, fungi, algae, fungi, and plants is that you kind of provide a standard system for communication and reduce amb ambigu ambiguity in the, the names of tax. It should be uh, clear what that name refers to via a type specimen. Uh, things which refer to the same type specimen um, should have the same name. And those principles are very important to ensure that, that, that objective use of a name is fixed in some reality. Other, otherwise, it's entirely a subjective exercise. The group has to be diagnostic. Um, there's little point using a nomenclatural device to recognize, to, to acknowledge something which is very difficult to communicate. Again, if you're interested in something which is difficult to communicate, um, really probably the only way to do that is, is think about it in terms of a, phy a phylogenetic hypothesis and, and understand it within the context of its relatives. And, to communicate it without a diagnostic feature easily is difficult. I think we have to consider how that is used. Uh, is it is it going to be you know what is the um, what is the likely consequence to the uses? Now bear in mind, for example, that the vast majority of, of human beings do not read taxonomic literature. Um, even the vast majority of scientists probably don't read taxonomic literature. Only 5% of, of names in, in, tax, in, in scientific literature even use the offer of the, of the name when they list, list species. So there are, we do have to kind of make things easy where we can for the rest of the, of the world's people. Future stability is important because you don't want to change everything, only to have to rechange it again in a few years. So not only does the phylogenetic hypothesis need to be fairly robust, um, how you divide it up, if po possible, should be not changed once you've decided to do it. Um, it obviously, sometimes that's inevitable, but um, you know, difficult to avoid. But you know, as, as a name, we should aim for, aim for stability, not only with regards to the past, but also with regards to the future. And finally, there's little point suggesting a classification which changes a whole bunch of names um, if the people who are also working in that group are just going to carry on doing what we currently do and use different names. So having, having a community agreement behind us is is also, I think, quite important. So, taking those, and do you want, you know, in this case, do we recognize Plectranthus and Coleus, or do we recognize one big genus? Now, as far as monophyly is concerned, it doesn't matter. Um, both the smaller clades and the larger clade are monophyletic. Um, lumping. Um, is slightly better for, nomen for, for nomenclature change than splitting it is, but really there's not that much in it, to be honest. A more general change in lumping it. Um, but I'm being generous, so I ticked the lump box. I think the big difference here is the next four criteria. A large pectoran finae 
not only gives you a very large grip, but one which is very difficult to communicate. Whereas splitting it not only gives you a lot of genera which are already recognized and accepted and fairly easy to, connect, to, to communicate. Use, well, as we say, saw with the Google Skull stats, um, so you, current usage over a period um, would defend continuing to recognize chorus because it's people, that's what people actually do in, in practical terms uh, by ratio of two to one. Future stability. Um, I felt that a large white transfers would at some time be split up. And part of the reason for that, that thought was that you have very well recognizable genera which are perfectly okay and are perfectly monophyletic and people are basically going to continue to use them. So having introducing a, a classification which, which conflicted with something which was unlikely to be accepted is probably not a good idea. And taxonomic agreement, um, I did try and make sure that the people working in the group basically agreed that, that resurrecting chorus was a good idea. So in this case, recognizing chorus as opposed to Pythonfus and uh, as opposed to merging Pythonfus was a decision we made. Now, I'd just like to go and think about a different group. Now, I do a bit of work for the Royal Horticultural Society. There are 20 million gardeners in the UK who get very upset when you change your plant name. Um, and 20 million gardeners is far more people than who will ever read any of my taxonomic papers. So it's important that we kind of think about our taxonomy in relation to people who just want to use the names and really don't care too much about the taxonomy. But, but most of scientists need good names, we need their evolutionary relationships. Um, how, how do we handle that? So in this example, recent work, uh, which I'll explain in a minute, was offering two different alternative approaches to salvia, which is the largest genus in Limaceae with almost a thousand species. And some people are arguing for one genus and other people are arguing for splitting it into a living genera. And here's some of the nicely provocative titles of the papers. Uh, Maria Will and Regine Klaus and Bockhoff, Time to Split Salvia, uh, they want to break it up. And Ryan Drew and his colleagues want to keep it united um, and have made arguments for it. Now, the important thing to realize here, this is, this is a single genus view. No one is arguing about the phylogeny. This is not an argument about one technique over another technique. The phylogeny is pretty robust. Um, it's been done by a variety of techniques. What we're really discussing here is where do we draw the line for genetic um, recognition? You can recognize it as one genus with subgenera, or you can recognize each of those groups as independent genera. If you recognize it as one genus, you only have to change 15 names, except one of them is rosemary, um, which is so widely used, it will impact a lot of people. However, going the other way, wanting to keep a, a monophyletic view of the world, you need to make about 700 name changes. So how does that one play out on the, on the criteria? Again, monophyly, the choice of whether you use one or, or 11 genera, it's agnostic, they're both monophyletic. Nomenclature change, far more impactful if you split it up into different genera. Ease of diagnosis, actually you could argue they're just as easy to recognize. You could, you could argue the splits are just as easy to recognize as, as a whole. Um, and, and part of the contention is, is around that. Um, the people who want to split want to, to split to reflect evolution, but as I said previously, um, you know, nomenclature is really a very blunt tool to do that. If you want to look at the details of a phylogenetic hypothesis, 
go look at the high phylogenetic hypothesis, don't lie in names to do it. What you need from the names is to point you at the latest taxonomic um, hypothesis. Usage, um, in this case, although some of the previous splits of Clectophanthus have old generic names, they are hardly ever used. Um, uh, so the use argument would, would be um, hugely in favour of, of, of keeping a large salvia. Future stability, again, the large salvia is easier. Once you start splitting salvia into a living genera, there are good arguments for further splitting some of those other genera. So even, for example, genus the small salvia sangiostricto could easily be split into two groups. The Chinese area again, could be split into two groups. So there's really no argument for futures because there's no taxonomic agreement. Um, you've got basically two opposing views of the, I think then really you've got it. Um, which would mean that we keep um, salvia as one genus. And so we should have salvia rosmarinus and not rosmarinus officinalis as the name, which is what I recommended. Um, the, the issue here is that we should also recognise so that the name rosmarinus officinalis will continue. People will still use it. Um, I bet you if you go to your nearest garden shop or market, or um, they will still be referring to rosemary as a rosemary. Many places that will still be labelling it as rosemary, rosemarinus officinalis. This is less of an issue now than it used to be. Twenty years ago, before the digital revolution, you know, um, this was an issue because you just had the name and then you had to go to libraries to look at it. With semantic searches, which can combine synonyms and searches. I think it's less of an issue. And I think the importance here is, is things like Catalog of Life and GBIF, or Checklist of Vascular Plants, providing an ontology to, to link names belonging to one species and using them for searching. Uh, but you're always going to get opposing views. You're always going to get a come across occurrences of citing taxa by different names. And what's really important is that we have some mechanism for ma mapping these names. So although I argue strongly for recognition of coleus and of uh, enlarged sal salvia, I'm also acutely aware that probably at first instance, an awful lot of people don't really care. We just want to get the names of the plants, which means that the work we do of, of, of cataloging synonyms and accepting names is exceptionally important because ultimately that's how that is how people are going to find information about the plant um, and it's that linkage of names of accepted names and synonyms together as a tool which i think will make um, a big difference in the future and has begun to make a big difference when i started as a taxonomist 30 years ago it was actually quite difficult um, to find all the names for a taxa, and it is becoming much easier, irrespective of how you, whether you disagree with a generic connotation. Okay, don't worry, I'm nearly finished. What am I doing? Okay, I'm slightly too long. Um, so I just want to uh, nip through, just remind you of, of the chorus of Pactophanthus um, uh, phylogeny. Quick look at how we are using that. Um, you can map um, a distribution to the Corius phylogeny, um, the Plectran phylogeny, phylogeny rather. What you find is the basal position is largely African. All migrations to Asia in yellow, Australia in black, Madagascar in green are from Africa and there are no returns to Africa. Um, from these areas. So it has been an out of African experience in terms of evolution of Coleus and Plectranthus and Plectranthony. Actually, only two genera, Plectranthus and Coleus, um, come out. 
distribution. Coleus, mostly African, fair number of species in Asia and Australia. And the Australian ones are actually morphologically quite similar. Uh, it's 52 species, all of which are very similar uh, compared to the diversity you see in Asia and in Africa. Pyctranthus, um, again, largely African, actually largely South African, one species in Sri Lanka. And I think I've still got a bit of work to do and just to make sure that is not a, a late dissemination of of a Madagascan or African species. I, I haven't managed to see if it is similar to anything. I don't think it is. So I do think it's a real endemic, but I just I got on the back of my mind to test that thoroughly. And Equilabium, two species mainland India, Equilabium molly and subincisum, uh, the rest are all African, tropical African mainly. One of the things that first interests me about this group is the habitat. So in doing these African floras, and you get different habitats. And quite often where you get a lot of species of the Ossomine, you don't get many species of the White Fanfine. For example, the Platostoma clade in Africa have a, have a huge number of species in this area, the poor mineral poor soils, uh, or rather the nitrogen poor soils of, of southern Shaba, Zambia, the Copper Belt, highly mineralized. And in Pyctranthus, you get a huge number of species here in the limestone, quite nutrient rich, very moist, uh, forested glades, um, and you don't get very many awesome mining. Similarly, in, in Indochina, you get Platostoma again in particular, doing lots of speciation in this dry sandstone area here. Um, and the Pyctranthini tend to speciate in the moister forested areas, random and hills and, and related areas. So there did seem to be a, a habitat preference, which we wanted to have a look at between the two subfamilies. In Africa, you get these dry woodland habitats, and you also get this mountain grassland and mountain forest patches. And for is over recent time, you get those move, those patches move depending on how much water there is around. Um, jump from where? So in Indochina you get the same thing, you get these dry sandstone areas um, and, and dry woodland and you get these very rich forests as well. And if you look at the habitats, um, the green is um, dry woodland and you find that although it's shifting quite a lot the pattern is significantly not random there does seem to be be fewer changes than you would expect so there is a phylogenetic signal there the move is, is from dry woods woodlands to other habitats again a bit like the, the distribution you rarely get um, changes in the other direction from from dry woodland or grassland back in, sorry, from grassland or um, forest back into uh, the dry woodland. It seems to be from dry woodland. So, but you do get speciation in habitats and also between habitats. Fire seems to have played an important part. I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, particularly in Pyctranthus, Equilabrium and Coleus. And this difference between Nosomini and um, quite fanfinny, which I talked and got me interested, I think is more likely to be a result of more speciation in the forest habitat in the quite fanfinny, rather than shifting between habitats. Um, yeah, because we're, we've only just got a more robust uh, phylogeny of Nosomini to compare that to. So that's a bit, bit of work in progress. If you date the, the phylogenies, you find that most of those species are happening at the same time that the habitats are getting drier and you're getting fewer forests. Forests are breaking up, you're getting dry, land, dry woodland being established in Africa. Late to mid Miocene. Just note here we have an issue with colours. 
although we've got a very good um, diagnosis point here, there are two main clades in coles which in molecular evidence are always recovered. There are no characters which diagnose these clades uniquely. So further work is to look at this in more detail, more sampling. Um, I think you can diagnose some of those terminal clades, but the, the current resolution of the phylogeny is very poor at the tips, so it's a bit difficult. So just clades and dates, we've got this awesome apoc thymophany split about 30 million years ago. Recognised genera are beginning to um, be, recon um, be diverge around 15 to 6 million years ago, which is around about the same sort of time and that happens in the Menfee as well, this is still good. And speciation is quite recent uh, in these where we have sufficient sampling to, to be able to make that statement. It seems to be fairly, fairly recent. Very quickly looking at use, you can look at the use of curves and unlike habitat and unlike distribution, the signal of, of use is much weaker. Um, and it's actually statistically not significant. You do get areas which seem to cluster where plants are used, um, but there is no strong phylogenetic signal here. And I think there's a number of difficult issues that we face using phylogeny and, and medicinal use, at least in the chorus white transfers concept. Um, synonymy, which we've talked about, uh, for, for us is easy because it's, uh, we do have a good, a good basis for synonymy and we can find the data. Other groups, that's not the case. Um, the sampling is um, non-random. <laughs> it's very biased towards things which are known to be medicinally. Um, and so da medicinal data, use data, is, is itself biased. And also there's a problem with including everything in the phylogeny. You, you don't, species level phylogenies are still difficult to prepare because you need to get good access of information. We try to do a species level uh, uh, phylogeny of equilabium, but actually it was very difficult to get all the species represented. So getting material for the phylogeny is still a problem. Um, also, the way that medicinal use is characterised can be very vague, which makes it difficult to know whether you're view looking at the same activity or not. The active constituents are not always known. And the pattern might only be at a particular taxonomic scale. Um, it might be, um, it might work at a small scale, but not be more homoplastic of a larger scale. So our basic conclusion is we need more data really to look at this in any, any meaningful way. There's also problems about how we, how we view medicinal use. Um, the information is fragmented. And, and you, they tend to be, studies tend to be of two sorts. One is they're ethnographic, which means you get a lot of information about the plants used by complete particular group of people. So when you come to look at that phylogenetically, it's, um, it's a bit random. Um, and now we're still with a few species um, in great depth, but we focus on all the unusual stuff and don't mention what the common stuff is. And, and, and in a medicinal group, sometimes it's the common things which work. Um, but we don't recognise what's present. Uh, we don't always record everything that's there. In fact, very rarely do we record everything that's there. That said, there do seem to be some patterns. We're just about to publish to show that actually the diterpenes in coleus R do have differences from the diterpenes in Pectranfus. Um, there's different, there are differences to the structure of diterpenes. You do also get diterpenes which are consistent across both genera. Some diterpenes seem to be focused in particular areas, and, and this is the Colus barbatus thing, which are particularly rich in these coleo and diterpenes. So there are some patterns, it's just not uh, particularly robust across the phylogeny. So, some final conclusions, you'll all be glad to know, you'll soon be able to go home. Um, 
Okay, so the pectranthus, as we knew it before this work started, uh, is parathyretic. Um, we recognise one new genus, actually it should be two new genus because I forgot about Equilabium. <laughs> um, Capitanopsis is, is Madagascar and Equilabium is um, in Africa. Originated in dry woodland, frequent moves to our habitats, but but it is, there is a significant taxonomic sig uh, phylogenetic signal in that. Migrations are out of Africa. And for uses, we need more data. There are, there are some patterns, but we do need more data. And finally, I'd like to thank everybody. Doing, doing work on a big paper actually involves a lot of people, and it would be impossible without collaboration across all those people here. Um, and I'm just going to leave this up if anyone's got any questions. But uh, one of the points I'd like to make is dealing with a thousand species in the clade and even 500 species in the subtribe, you do need collaboration. It's really impossible to do it on your own. Okay, that's me done. I'm happy to take any questions if anybody's got any. Hi, Alan. Sunoj from Calicut. Sunoj. Hi, Sunoj. Yeah, I want to ask you something. Yeah, please yeah. do, Sunoj. Nice to yeah. see you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the One of the criteria that you used is phylogeny, which is based on three chloroplast regions. Uh, so if we use uh, angiosperm phylogeny toolkit, uh, I think uh, you focus on angiosperm 353 region, universal probe. So would, the, would the, there be any change in the present concepts uh, what you have just presented here? Do you expect? Yeah, uh, that's a good point. Um, I think if I was doing this work now, um, yeah. we would try and use that. It is, it is a bit more costly, but that would be the right thing to do. I don't, given that we now have an, in South Africa some nuclear work also being done, which seems to suggest the genera are okay. Um, I don't think it will make a difference. Uh, I, I think if it did make a difference, it wouldn't make a difference to the actual recognized groups, but it could, it could, it could inform the relationship between those groups. Um, the plastome analysis is not particularly robust in how those recognized genera relate to one another. Uh, there are a couple of points of, of relatively weak support, and I would expect something like a, a kind of phylogenomic approach to give a, to, to clarify the, the arrangements of, of um, genera in the plectron finae and subtribes within the plectron finae, uh, within the osamine, osamine rather. Uh, so I think I think at the larger scale, I, I would expect to give a stronger backbone, a more robust hypothesis of relationships. I think it would also help with things like coleus, where although we seem to have two reasonably well robust plates, um, there is very weak support in the more terminal areas of coleus. Although part of the reason for that is is it's 294 species of which we've probably sampled, um, I think about 70. So we're only at about 20% sampling of the coleus. So I think um, using a phylogenomic approach coupled with greater sampling within coleus would be a sensible thing to do. And I think it might help us understand uh, relationships with, within coleus much better. Any questions, other participants and dignitaries? Yeah, I'm, I'm, may I take a question? Or yeah, yeah, a question? yeah. Hi, uh, question. Hi, Alan. Well, many thanks for this impressive piece of work and presentation of more or less most of your research work, right? So, <laughs> um, one question is, uh, do you have any guess how genome duplication or polyploidization may affect the picture in uh, the the uh, arrangement of the of the natural groups or these monophyletic groups? Yeah, it's possible. Um, 
We don't have that much evidence yet. I think certainly there's something going on. Let's take, think of the subtribal level at the moment. There certainly seems that there is a serious incongruence between the nuclear data we have and the past data. Yeah. So there is something going on there uh, which needs explored. I think the other thing, which is uh, another place that I know there's a problem, as opposed to places where I don't know there's a problem yet because we've not looked, is Osimo, where you where there have been problems. Um, one of the reasons why we haven't done ITS earlier was because of, of that issue in that um, Sabine Wetzel at Gattersley had been tried it and she had to clone to get um, different versions of the ITS gene. So, so there are issues about the nomenclature, uh, sorry, the, the, the genome studies. Uh, again, I think, as Sunaj suggested, using using the techniques now available to us, I think that would help us understand that much better and it would be the logical next step. Um, it, it's difficult. Um, on one hand, I feel that the genera are probably pretty stable um, and pretty well pretty well supported. I think detailed relationships within genera, um, relationships between the genera and relationships between the subgenera really do need a bit more robust analysis before we're fully clear. But as a taxonomic exercise, um, I think the taxa are right. And, and it's just unraveling that. And, and I think that we don't really know the answer to your question. It's quite possible that genome duplication events are are playing an important part. Um, but I, I think it's particularly interesting on looking at, um, I would still kind of like to understand the genetic basis between that habitat thing, between what's, what's going on between, you know, why is it that you get, think the patostomal clade um, what it, speciating enormously in areas where the plectran finae don't and vice versa. Um, and, and I'd be interested to see you know, what traits are involved in that. All of the species which hyperaccumulate metals, well, they don't hyperaccumulate metals, I shall rephrase that. All the species which live in highly mineralized soils um, are in the and we do it by exclusion. So there's also, I think, interesting um, questions about functional genes, which need to be explored, which would also shed some light in that habitat issue. Hi, this is Alan. I, uh, it's not a question, but uh, I just wanted to share. You see, uh, you have shown about lumping and splitting, all those things, but what, uh, what do you think about this uh, name confusion because of creating because of this? Because many we taxonomies, we feel okay, we understand why we are doing that. But for a non taxonomist, it is a confusion for them, and they are saying botanists or taxonomists are changing every now and then and making them so confusing. That's why I suppose you change that colleagues group to plantains all or you from raspberries to other, then whatever they have been using for so many years is going to be thrown here and there. And all, yeah. all they may not find that name in that again. Then that is how, how do we solve this problem? That is it. So I think the problem is actually worse than you suggest. Um, at first approximation, most people don't care about taxonomy. And we have to recognize this. You look at, there are all kinds of names used for plants, medicinal names, ayurvedic names, Chinese medicinal names, all of which are valid within their context. I think this is less of a problem than it used to be. Uh, if we think about how the semantic web develops, what is important is not the name we choose to use, ultimately. It is connecting the names that mean the same thing. 
we will never get a practitioner in Chinese med medicine to use a Linnaean taxonomic name when their discipline for the last 500 years has been using a Chinese medicinal name. It won't happen. And it would be pointless to make it happen. So the trick is to develop mechanisms which allow the mapping of names which mean the same thing. Now, that is getting closer. We have um, a project I was involved with called the Medicinal Plant Names um, Services. And what we did in that program, which was funded by the Wellcome Trust, was deliberately not to say something is accepted, except in a taxonomic sense. What we wanted to do was allow people to disambiguate the information using whichever system we did. Now, taxonomists are notoriously bad for doing taxonomy for taxonomists. And I think at one level that's correct because we have a, we have a rule of systems which we can impose and, and we can use. So, so when we use Linnaean names, we work as a logical thing with little with little ambiguity. However, most of the science which goes on in the planet and most of the people in the street and most of the people who use plant medicines don't give a shit, frankly. They don't care. They just want to use the name that we buy the plant from in the market. Or we want to use the name which their doctor is going to give them in the field. So we shouldn't get too precious about taxonomic names. We need them. Doing our classic job of synonymy is really important. Mm -hmm. But the solution to this is not taxonomic, it's informatic. And allowing, for example, as, uh, um, as a medicinal plant name services portal does, searches using all the names for a particular thing is the way to go. And I don't think we're too far from that. Um, if we just want to use one name, we live in danger of missing information. And we have to develop informatically ways to join the names up. So you search, uh, search using an ontology or a vocabulary rather than a name. And that's what I think is important. And as taxonomists, our job is to make sure that our Linnaean names, which refer to types, which is the only objective fact in taxonomy. It, you know, otherwise, tax, taxonomy is, is essentially subjective. That those, those objective facts are linked to our subjective concepts as clearly as we can, preferably with reference to our genetic hypothesis. That's what I see in our job, and we shouldn't get too excited about whether our name is accepted or a synonym, because most of the planet doesn't care. No, thank you. I'm, I'm leaving, so go. thank you so much, Alain. May, may I comment on that quickly? Um, yeah. I hope somebody I think, does. I was trying to be provocative. <laughs> no, no, that's perfect, I think, because the enrichment stuff is, this is actually the road we are all going right now. and. Um, with the, with the um, propagation of the semantic web. I mean, these things will somehow dissolve, I trust. But our job now, in my opinion, is to, to actually also attach images, verified images to these names. Because yeah. this, I mean, just look at the web now. If you search up for any particular taxon or any name, you almost certainly find some images, right? It's not yeah. true for all species or for all names, but for quite a percentage. And there is no re no means at the moment for kind of qualifying these images. So if we as a taxonomist manage to stick or to attach images, illustrative images to all these names or to all these pools of names, you know, um, this will help this, uh, the community tremendously, I think. And this will also uh, increase the credibility of our science in the in the in the society and in the um, yeah yeah 
I agree completely, Christian. It's it's basically a data exercise that you want to to make those links between definable facts, whether that fact is an image of a type specimen, an image of a verified herbarium specimen, a field image which relates to that herbarium specimen. That's the way to go. So you you build up an evidence base to to illustrate the concept we're using. Uh, now I request SS, Dr. S. S. Das sir in charge technical publication and media sale for vote of thanks. Yeah, good afternoon, Dr. Patton and uh, Christian. And thank you, Dr. Anand, yes. for giving this opportunity for this uh, vote of thanks uh, yes. on the end and the remark on the today's talk. And at the outset, I sincerely thanks uh, Dr. Alan Patton, uh, Royal Botanical Garden Q, for accepting our invitation as a resource person in this international seminar and delivering this excellent talk uh, regarding this revising the genetic limit of uh, genus Coleus and uh, Plectanthus and family of the Lamiaceae and the tribe Rosimi. Uh, undoubtedly, his vast experience in the field of plant taxonomy, his uh, molecular biology and the virus inventory is made no exaggeration. I think uh, in uh, the Indian audience, all the, for the, all the Indian audience, your name is uh, well known and uh, they are well acquainted with the uh, name of uh, uh, Dr. Petra. And uh, as Dr. Mao has already been mentioned these things uh, before in the welcome address. And regarding today's talk, it is really, it is uh, very much relevant to the current scenario uh, because uh, both the genus Plectranthus and the Coleus are uh, is widely used in horticulture or on the medicinal values as he has also mentioned as uh, in the Chinese medicine, uh, uh, traditional medicine history. And in if you see the current uh, taxonomic treatment also, both the genera are also very interesting, including the formerly, because it is formally recognized in the coleus uh, or the uh, solemn stemon, other genera within the plectranthus. But many of the, these species as general refer as coleus is frequently used as the common names for uh, this species, uh, which increases uh, uh, the real confusion about Dr. Mao has uh, 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 really asked and the uh, pattern has uh, very much uh, nicely clarified. And when we talk about the recent uh, phylogenetic work uh, as shown that a circumscription of uh, this plectanthus need to be uh, viewed in the context of the related genera of the tribe of semi and including the, uh, the coleus and other genera. So during the last uh, uh, one decade, there has been a debate among the uh, systematists about the adequacy of the morphological data and the versus of the molecular data for the reconstruction of the phylogeny, which is also true for the uh, tribe uh, Osemi, and including the genera Plectanthus, Coleus, and uh, Thoncropsia, or in the other genera in the same tribe. That's why these all are excellently explained uh, by Dr. Ibetan, and the generic limit of the both the genera and the delimitation of the both the genera has been excellently narrated by him. And I hope it must have encouraged many of the young botanists uh, or many of the young uh, fellow researchers who have participated uh, in this uh, webinar today. And I hope it will open up a new arena for the study of uh, the taxonomy of Indian uh, Lemiaceae also. Uh, because many of the species and many of the, uh, the uh, members have been uh, distributed in India also. And I must say that uh, Dr. Patton uh, have said a wonderful uh, knowledge and gave a lot of impact. Uh, inputs to this botanical fraternity uh, today uh, through this webinar and i hope uh, this must uh, uh, repeat uh, many more times and i once again sincerely thanks uh, for delivering his excellent lecture and uh, today also very interestingly we also uh, got an opportunity to meet our old colleagues uh, dr sk srivastava dr vp prasad dr arvind pramanik who have also joined this webinar i must thank uh, them and uh, also all my uh, colleagues from uh, Botanical Society of India and all my colleagues from abroad who has joined this webinar and for the and also for their gracious presence and make this uh, webinar very a uh, fruitful event. And uh, lastly, I must thanks to my mentor and our team leader, Dr. Mao, the director of Botanical Society of India, 
for being a constant support and encouragement uh, uh, for organizing this type of webinars uh, on the contemporary issues uh, with a motto to really create a interest among the young researchers of uh, particularly in the taxonomic field i uh, thanks to all of you once again and i also thanks dr patton for his excellent talk and the excellent participation and thanks a lot and have a happy great day ahead thank you very much thank you dr dash thank you thank you to the bsi for inviting me uh, i wish you all a, a good afternoon and uh, have a great weekend thank you for listening <laughs>